There we go. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Mr. Snell. Cademan has helped me this year with the senior assistant in Great Books 2, and I'm excited for him to deliver his thesis to you today. I'm joined on the panel by Mr. Fithian and Mr. Westfall. Um, I'll pray and we'll get started. Lord, thanks so much for this day and for Cademan and for the man that you've uh, made him to be. I pray that you would give him calm nerves today and deliver his message well and with clarity and that you would uh, allow him to be thoughtful in his uh, answering of the questions today. We pray that you just give him uh, your spirit today and let him be bold. In your name, amen. Thank you. This is awesome. Okay. <laughs> um, what do you think of when you hear the word chivalry? Does your mind jump to forgotten times of heroic knights in gleaming armor, slaying the mythical dragon to rescue and win the heart of the fair maiden? Or do you more easily picture that man at Chick-fil-A who holds the door open for the woman with the stroller? It's likely you think of some version of both, but if you can't, don't worry. You aren't in trouble, but chivalry might be. In a world quick to dent absolute truth and avoid the demands of any lofty standards, we could unknowingly navigate life without a reliable compass or even a plumb line. What if the tools we need most are found in a chivalric code of strong virtues, morals, and ideals originating in the Christian faith? What if those tools are just missed by many as old-fashioned or even offensive? In light of this, how do we not conform to our world's diminishing standards? More personally, how do we as men form a godly code of chivalry that marks us as the knights of our day? We first need to define chivalry. Encyclopedia Britannica defines it as the sum of the ideal qualifications of a knight, including courtesy, generosity, valor, and dexterity in arms. This was the original meaning during the Middle Ages. Brett McKay, I mean, <laughs> Scott Farrell, an English literature major, professor, and author, has published many articles on the medieval history of, yes, and uh, the ideals of chivalry. He defines chivalry as hope, kindness, respect, integrity, responsibility, and courage. Another acclaimed author and podcaster, Brett McKay, founder of the Art of Manliness book series, has these virtuous badges to pin onto the definition of chivalry. Resolution, self-reliance, discipline, and honor. But the most important and vital aspects of chivalry are honor, respect, courage, discipline, and love. A man should make the master of these five virtues a priority in his life in order to live them out, to serve, and love others. Chivalry hasn't always been defined with these five virtues from the combination of Scott Farrell and Brad McKay. Their founding was a different time. The Middle Ages were a time of transforming from Roman culture to the culture of the Renaissance and the era of the Knights. As these warriors evolved, so did their creeds and morals in order to better serve those around them. The word chivalry comes from the French word chevalier, or knight. As a knight, you had to hold yourself accountable to your ruler and be noble by defending your home from an enemy and knowing when to show mercy to others. Since these laws were used by the nobles, they were soon sought after and practiced by the culture surrounding them. As time went on, the virtues and practice of chivalry rose and fell with the ideas of the times. The first ideas of chivalry originated in a time of brutal battles and lawlessness. Soon, people judged chivalry's book by its cover in relation to war and didn't want any part of it. The idea of chivalry being dead or forgotten is as old as chivalry itself, and it was almost lost when the progression of modern times turned it away from the loving virtues towards the brutality of war. Even though wars and warriors founded chivalry, the morals and virtues like honor, respect, integrity, discipline, and love is what modern-day chivalry should look like. Unfortunately for most people, chivalry isn't what it's supposed to be. In today's world, we are in a limbo of not knowing what chivalry is supposed to be. From a study conducted by Texas A&M University, a survey showed the minds, oh, some people view chivalry as the mindset of elite warriors, glorifying violence and demeaning women. Yes, chivalry was started in a time of elite warriors, the knights, but it was never made to demean women. If chivalry was created to protect people and women, then where did this idea of demeaning come from? Over the centuries, men and women have stepped on chivalry's back to use as a platform for their fight against sexism and for feminism. Since the 1960s, women have been actively pursuing equality among men, especially in the business world. But God created man and woman, 
regardless of race or customs, to be equal under him. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. God says we are all equal, and we are to treat each other as equals. But many people don't share this biblical perspective of love. A survey taken by the Daily Mail found that from the 2,400 commenters on one of their articles on chivalry, that most of them believe this line. Men who hold open doors for women are sexist, not chivalrous. This phrase is born out of the thinking that some women believe men are demeaning women by doing actions that they themselves are perfectly capable of doing. When you live as a godly gentleman, you will see yourself become a better person and gentleman to those around you. If you were to live as a worldly gentleman, you'll be constantly changing with the ideas of the times in order to please people that... In order to please people... If you were to live as a godly gentleman, with the love of God burnt to your heart and spirit, you will see yourself become a better man, husband, and gentleman to those around you. For true chivalrous men, it's not out of sexism or demeaning that they serve or love others. It's out of love that resembles Christ's love towards us. Mr. Jack Swallow, one of our 11th grade etiquette teachers, gave the example of a man who held the door open for a lady. The lady told the man, it's, you don't have to hold the door open for me, I'm not a lady. To which the man replied, it's not because uh, you're a lady I hold the door for you, it's because I'm a gentleman. As gentlemen, we have a duty to uphold our morals and beliefs in our day-to-day -day life. Mr. Swallow went on to say, a person carries chivalry as a virtue. It's not something you put on or take off, you carry it with you all the time. Just because the world says something like chivalry is bad doesn't mean it is. The world didn't accept Christ, and we shouldn't be surprised when the world doesn't accept a Christian ideal like chivalry. To be chivalrous, we have to reject what the world accepts. We have been conditioned by our leaders and idols to think a certain way about certain things. In Fahrenheit 451, one of Ray Bradbury's main themes is the idea of conformity versus individualism. Once Guy Montag, the main character, chooses not to convert, convert to his world's perverted morals, he is exiled by society. The virtues, are popular, the virtues of chivalry are popular in today's world as long as they are accepted by and chosen by the, world that, that, by the people that live in this world. If the world doesn't approve of something you believe or do, you will be exiled. Likewise, chivalry has been exiled, pushed under the bed, and forgotten about. Conforming to what the mob mentality wants is usually bad, and in this case, is detrimental to the state and health of chivalry. In my freshman year, we read St. Augustine's Confessions, in which he speaks of the ramifications of going with the flow of society. He concluded that we aren't to go along with and conform to what the world wants. He said, Right is right, even if no one is doing it. Wrong is wrong, even if everyone is doing it. We are to stand against the worldly ideas and trends of the New Age thinking and beliefs. When we go after or become what the world has to offer us, we are disregarding the plan God has for us. If we don't become of this world and stay on the straight and narrow path, we will grow as Christians and as chivalrous men. The Bible is full of stories and parables about how a Christian is supposed to be, or how a person is to live like Christ. The Bible doesn't mention chivalry specifically, but it's full of the same virtues and morals that reside in Christ like chivalry. A prominent verse from Ephesians is 525, which says, Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is saying how the love that God shows us is to be sacrificial, and we are to share that love by being sacrificial with our friends, family, eventually our spouses, so that when we stand before God on the throne, or before the throne, um, that he, can, he might say, well done, good and faithful servant. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says, Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to its own interests, but also to the interests of others. In my interview with Billy Rays, pastor of 35 years and current pastor of Sovereign Grace Church, he says that the treatment of others ultimately comes down to loving each other. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 says, Love is patient, love is kind. It is not envy, it is not boast, it is not proud. It doesn't dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, 
always hopes, always perseveres. Pastor Reyes went on to say that the virtues of chivalry tie into Christ-like love as both show us how to live in our world, regardless of trends or ideas. And we have forgotten how to live both in our world. Are you loving when you ignore someone in need of help? When you rush by the door so you don't have to open the door for them? When a student asks you for help for on homework assignment that you know you're good at, but you choose to say no anyways? When that annoying man at work comes to you and he wants to talk for a second, but you re- you're really not feeling it? What would Jesus do? Would he walk away if someone needed help or wanted to spend time with you? Would he? No. Yes! Woo! Man! <laughs> Very on point. Man, gold star for everybody. No. Jesus is perfect and shows perfect love to all, regardless of their sin and mistakes. Humans judge other humans on their sins and mistakes, but Christ judges us judges us righteous and unrighteous alike. We are to treat others the way we'd want to be treated, with loving kindness. The stories of the Bible are rooted in love, and we as men are to live a chivalrous life after God's example. But, <laughs> but, to, be a sh- but to be a chivalrous gentleman, you have to be a man. We are currently facing a problem of men not knowing what a man should be. A man is to protect to live chivalrously, to demonstrate what a Christian man looks like, to build other men up. A man is to be a gentleman. But these definitions have been swept under the rug in many areas of our lives. Instead, we have an internet full of how a man should behave, how to act, how to keep up with the current ideas of the times. To be was acceptable to everyone, and not was acceptable to God. We as men have, have lost sight of what God has set out for us but there is hope. We can return to chivalry and the love God showed us. Likewise, we are to love others. 1 Peter 4.8 says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Love conquers all, so we aren't to hold a grudge against one another. A man is not just to show love, he is to live love. Trying to live in love is hard work, but we have the greatest example to follow, Jesus Christ. So when we enter each day with a Christ-like attitude, a chivalrous spirit, and a manly mindset, we are living what a man should be. Men, look at yourselves and ask, am I pursuing an old path lined with chainmail and forgotten creeds of virtues and ideals originating the Christian faith? Remember the times in which chivalry was born. Remember the battles it had to endure to make its way to us today. When you picture chivalry, remember to place it alongside the Christian virtues as well. If your answer is yes, then I welcome you as a man into this, this kind of this, like this really cool frat of a, of a group. Um, if not, if you don't consider yourself a gentleman as a man, if you don't consider yourself manly, if you don't pursue God, then I encourage you to seek out what is holding you back from, up, from becoming a man under Christ that shows how, you're to, how you are to follow him by living out the chivalrous virtues. Because men, it's easy to blame the feminist movement and the world. But I was talking with my granddad last night, and he was saying how we always say they're the bad ones. They have influenced us. They are the the ones who have made us what we are. But that they he was talking about is us. We as men, we as men, sorry, we as men, there it is, um, have, le- have let the world push us around. And I'm not saying this is a call to action, let's go burn some buildings. <laughs> Goodness, no. But we have willingly stood aside and let the world push us over. And for that, I'm sorry, because I am guilty just the same as you are. So the next time you see a man close the door without looking for someone behind him and can see a family their arms full of children and bags, rush to their rescue. Grab that door handle with an urgency, like it might be the last time you do something good for this world. And hold the door open for a grateful family. Be the chivalrous impact in someone's life. Be chivalrous, because we are called to be. Thank you.
Boom. Great job, Cayman. Thank you. Um, can you pass me the coffee cup? This one? No, the coffee. Coffee, coffee. Yeah. I saw it in your bag. Oh, wait. What? Oh. I was like, this is the coffee cup. No, that's the one I want. I knew it. I saw that in your bag. I didn't want to bring it up. I didn't want to see your thunder. Can I read this? The Lord what finds you out. Yes. says to the audience. <laughs> There's a story yeah. to this. It's not just, yeah. yeah. It says, uh, some things are just better rich. Coffee, chocolate, <laughs> cowboys. <laughs> I was young when I bought that cup. Yeah. I didn't know what it meant. Some weird shit. <laughs> What are your plans for next year, Cademan? So I plan on attending Texas Tech, where I, uh, I want to study agriculture, but I'm not sure exactly what I want to do with my life. I just know I want to build something, because I love working with my hands. Okay. Um, I'll start you off with a softball. Sick. So if we get this idea of chivalry from knights from the Middle Ages, uh, and they involve slaying dragons, like you mentioned yeah. in your uh, paper, do you think dragons existed? Actually, Mr. Westfall said they existed. Because, I they existed. okay, but this is a grown man, like right here, a pastor, uh, that I do believe they existed at some point, maybe. Um, more like my faith that they existed is even stronger thanks to Revelation class with Mr. Westfall. Okay. But it'd be pretty cool. All right, let's, uh, let's dive into something a little bit deeper. So I'm going to read you out some things. Okay. Here we go. Courtesy, generosity, valor, dexterity in arms, hope, kindness, respect, integrity, responsibility, courage. Resolution, self-reliance, discipline, honor, honor, respect, courage, discipline, love. That's a lot of character traits that yes. you mentioned in your paper regarding chivalry. Yeah. How did you decide on those five and those five only? So I really, it was really hard because uh, there's a, obviously a lot of them. But so a lot of them can be tied into each other. So like uh, kindness can fall under respect. Integrity can also go into discipline. And so it's like I didn't like I didn't take from any of them, but I just condensed them into like more powerful words. And so like honor is more like respect, but I had to make respect its own separate thing because I could have tied all this up into just being love. And because it's like that's like I feel like that would be an easy answer. But I believe the other four are just as, are just as important as saying love that um, I really just had to condense them. Okay. So my follow-up question to that is, is chivalry an arbitrary character trait? Like, can I also come along to your five and throw in another character trait if I would like to, um, and it would still be called chivalry? Can I take away one of your five character traits and it still be chivalry? Hmm. I believe so, as long as that, like, that virtue or aspect you want to throw onto chivalry falls under like, Christ-like guidelines. So it's like you can't be like uh, like honor, respect, courage, discipline, love, and the love of chili. It's like uh, it's like it has to originate from like a place of the heart, and the heart is not always the most reliable thing. But I would just cross check it with the Bible. The follow up question to that is: Can I just call being sh- uh, chivalrous being Christ like? Why do we need this word chivalry if I can just say? Be like Jesus. It's hmm. a good question. Well, it's my belief that Jesus and God are the the best examples for chivalry. So I think you can um, you can call it like I'm going to be Christ-like. I'm going to be chivalrous. But um, saying you're going to be Christ-like can be really broad. And so um, instead of me saying uh, the forgotten art of being Christ-like, um, I focused in on chivalry because it's an aspect of being Christ-like, but it also has its own little like subsections. Okay. Um, going back to the knights question, do you think the knights got the idea of chivalry from being Christ-like? Where do you think that originated from? So, I really wish we had like three hours to kill on this because I had a, I had like we don't by the way. Uh, sorry uh, <laughs> I had about four or five more pa- full pages of information that I had to delete. Um, I know you did. I had, I had a lot. I had so, to read it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, like, where they got the idea is from the church. And so, chivalry kind of sprung up around 1110 AD. Um, and I'm not... I, see, I deleted it, so now I can't really remember all of it. But um, that was a lot of the feudal lords and, like, all of that. So, everyone kind of came together. It's like, hey, like, we can't just be tyrants because um, there's some rebellion. But uh, it was based off of, like, what the church wanted a knight to be. And so, that a knight or a noble. So, that's what they would base their life around. 
And so that's where it came from. Okay. The Chinese also have a really cool version of chivalry. Okay, that's for the three hours. Yeah, discussion. yeah. Man. Okay. Um, can women also have honor, respect, courage, discipline, and love? Yes. So <laughs> why is chivalry only a character trait that a man can have? So I do believe women have their own version of chivalry. I just can't talk about it because um, I think that would look weird for one, me, me being as a man, talking about like how a woman should be chivalrous. Um, but in my research, I did find how a woman should behave. I just didn't research it because that wasn't my topic. But I do believe women have their own version of chivalry. I'm just not completely sure what that is. Do they have a special word for it like we have for chivalry? Is mm-hmm. it some cool word that as the fraternity of men, we just aren't yeah. let into the The sorority of sisters, I'm not sure. Like... <laughs> Like dude or do it, do that, like Mr. Waller would say. I'm not sure. Okay, so what you're telling me is maybe I should go talk to Mrs. Snow. Yes, I was like, she's probably yeah. in one. She, you just don't know it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll go ahead and pass it along to Mr. Fithian. Awesome. All right. Outside. This is a really fun topic, and, and I'm yeah. glad to get to discuss it with you. Um, first thing I want to know is. Favorite class at MCA and why? Mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm, bad, I'm really scared because I was like, I've had you for like a lot of my BSM and Revelation, and I had you for geometry. Man, 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 man. It'd be hard. Okay, I mean, I was like, man, I don't want to offend anybody. Uh, I would have to say like either 7th Admin with Mr. McDuffie and Mr. Waller because it's like, in that we read Love Does by Bob Goff, which is a really good book and so that's like that's that was one of my like inspirations to write this paper going through it um or like american history i love history or any great books yeah i love reading that's like half the classes you <laughs> yeah sorry i'll just say great books all of them awesome thank you um okay so with these aspects of chivalry that you've you've laid out um which one do you find the hardest to practice mm. I would say uh, probably courage, because it's like I'm an introvert by nature. Um, but Bear Grylls says it best. He says he says courage is 99% caution, 1% recklessness. And so um, I would say I would I would almost be like, well, I I just don't like want to do anything because it's like I'm not very reckless, or it's like I don't believe I have the courage. And so I fall into the trap of like not not doing anything, um, almost like bystander effect that. Uh, I don't know, because sometimes I don't feel like it's my place to do anything, even when I know deep down it is, and so that was a lost opportunity. So I'd say courage. That's a good answer. Um, I mean, I want you to grow in that, but good answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so Mr. Snow kind of got at some of these thoughts, but this idea of, of living Christ-likely or living a godly life, it, if you live a godly life as a man, will you have check the box on chivalry. Going back to what Mr. Snell said in his question on like, is it, can I just call it Christ-like or chivalry? Um, I would say if you, is, if you, you're at the end of your life and you're dying and you're going back through everything you've done and you get to heaven and God's like, you are a, you are a godly, manly man, then I would, I would feel comfortable saying yes. I would say if, if you consider yourself godly and you live godly, then you also live the the virtues that are in chivalry. Here's another kind of question in this vein. Why do we need an adjective to tell us about a man? Why can't I just say, there's a man, and we already know these things are true about him? So I believe we don't know those things are true about him. Because we don't know the man's character. Like, if I, if I didn't know you and I saw him on the street, like, oh, there's a man. Then he must be chivalrous. He must be a manly man. He must be godly. It's like, those are big assumptions. And um, I always heard that was safe not to assume of anything. And uh, I, don't, I don't believe so. No. What does that tell you about the state of creation? That you can't look at a man and go, I already know something about him. So... That was a lot of tears writing this because uh, it makes me really mad and sad um, that men have lost something that we like we should have. And so it was in my third paragraph. I was talking about the progression of modern times. 
And so there was about a thousand years that we like I couldn't cover because I had to delete all that. Um, but it's like we went from it's like oh you think of a knight and it's like were all of them good? No. Was, is every man good? No. And um, what was sorry? What was your original question? What, what does that tell you about creation? Mm. So my whole like idea or like I guess you'd call it like my like sub thesis is that men have lost sight of who they are. We have lost um, like what we are supposed to be under God. And so as far as creation goes. I think we've um, devolved or diminished from like the original path, and like I was saying, it's like it's part the world's part uh, or fault, part like feminism, not women. Sorry, sorry, uh, part like the the bad side of like feminism, um, and then it's really just us. We've let ourselves slip. Good. Yeah. No, I I think you're poking at the things that are going through my head. Um, this idea of being a knight, I, right? This didn't very much appeal to me. Whenever you know, I think about being a boy. Um, my son is very into swords and shields these days. Um, it, th- these things make me think of the armor of God. Mm-hmm. Like, can you can you draw some connections to chivalry and like spiritual, basically spiritual warfare? Hmm. So I haven't, I haven't really like, um, I can't remember everything about the armor of God. Do you want me to put it in front of you? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. It's right there, the second paragraph. All right. Um, so are you saying like, what is the correlation between chivalry and the arm, like the, the armor of God? Something in that vein, right? Because right, if if being Christ-like covers being chivalrous, mm-hmm. I would submit that this is part of being Christ-like. Mm-hmm. So how do you how do you how do you connect these ideas? So uh, there's a lot of symbolism with the armor of God, and I love it. Uh, I need to study more up like more up on it, but uh, like the helmet of salvation and the sword of truth. Uh, no, where's the sword? But uh, like I do believe it is a it is armor you put on yourself every day because with Mister Swallow's example with the man telling the woman it's like I'm a gentleman you like you like it's not because you're a lady I hold the door open for you it's because I'm a gentleman and then later on in his actual quote um, or one of his quotes is uh, it's not something you put on or take off you carry it with you all the time so I guess my like my counter question is do you take off your armor of God when you come home do you take I, it off when you're com- where you like, you feel comfortable or like I think. Uh, to be transparent, I struggle to keep it on. Like there, my my sin nature is constantly trying to shed mm-hmm. the uh, the garments of war. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would liken it to the armor of God. Yeah. No, I I like. There's part of me that's like, what what did God intend when He created us? Right? Like if we look in Genesis, like have dominion over the earth. Like He wants us to be in charge. He wants us to be. I'll say this lightly, higher than knights. Mm -hmm. He wants us to be princes and princesses. What's your thought on that? So, um, when I hear knight, I think of like middle class, um, I guess is like what they were. They were like, they were like not quite noble, but they were considered noble. And so it's a little, a little weird. So when God calls us, um, to be like, uh, like princes or princesses, um, I do believe, like, if he wants it, then his will be done. Um, but I don't, like, it's hard to wrap my brain around that it's like I can be something better than chivalrous because being a gentleman is something I've always wanted to be. And being something higher is like, whoa, like, that's like the fourth dimension. And um, Euclid. Well said. Yeah, there it is. Very good. All right, I'm going to pass the mic. All right. Thank you. Okay. Here's note. So, <clears throat> what. What got you interested in this topic to begin with? Because you said just now it's from it's been from a long time, and so when did this start? So a lot of my inspiration to write this is that I'm leaving home, and so I've been under the like the like I don't like how I'll call it the force field of like um, like my parents and uh, like my church and all this that I'm about to go into like the world and um, get tempted and struggle and do all the like like do try to do my best and live for God 
but um, one thing, just like looking, like going to colleges and like just kind of walking around is just like, man, like the guys don't seem very friendly or like they like don't treat their girls right. And mm-hmm. um, that really gets under my skin. And it's like, maybe it, maybe it shouldn't. And then I was like, no, it definitely should. Yeah. And um, so the, a lot of my inspiration came from uh, me actually going out into the world and being my own person. Um, and then like being my own person, it's like I'll begin to date and then I'll eventually marry. And it's like, how do I want to treat my wife? And it's like, my dad has been one of the greatest examples um, to be like, how to treat your wife. Because I think he's done a great job. That, uh, so that, yeah, going into the world and being a uh, future husband and father is my inspiration. Okay, very good. All right, so now, since you're supposed to carry chivalry with you, mm-hmm. right, I'm going to ask you random questions all over the place to see if you can hold it together. Okay. All right, okay. So, first of all, tell me about your knot that you have here. I've never seen a oh. knot tied like that before. So, this is an Elridge knot. Okay. And so, uh, I like to experiment with different knots, and so I usually go with, like, a Windsor, because it's perfect for, like, every occasion. Yeah. Um, but the Elridge um, is a little more hard. It's about 15 steps, um, when, like, a regular knot is... Maybe like anywhere from three to five. Yeah. Um, that I was really happy. Like I haven't tied one of these in a long time, but it I tied really it first, good. first try. And I was like, yeah. man, this looks great. And, yeah. Uh, so that that that's where that's the story of the it's, knot. It's really cool. I, the, the, unfortunately, I keep being drawn back to it. Yeah. You know, I'm we can unable switch to ties. Break away. Like, you can, yeah. you can wear the. Oh, this looks really good. Okay. So then, um, going back to you said eleven ten eighty. Yes. Okay. All right. And so you talked about the feudal system. Mm-hmm. One, you know, the feudal system there are serfs. Yes. Right. And so there's these knights and then these serfs that, mm-hmm. from what I understand, didn't live a great life. Nope, not at all. So how does that work if a system where there are these knights that that have the chivalry and yet there's these serfs who are treated poorly? Like how do you reconcile those things? That the chivalry up here. But then how do the knights interact chivalrously with the serfs? So in uh, a lot of cases, like I think it was World History 1, that we were setting up on knights. Excuse me. And um, how a lot of them actually abuse their power. And so those are really the stories you hear about. I feel like we only hear, like majority, we only hear the bad. So it's like we only base our opinions and views off of the bad. Okay. Um, but for a lot of them, it was like the knights are giving these creeds. And I said it, I think, also my third paragraph, how um, it's like over the course of time, I'm not sure how much time, that um, it's like the knights were still the knights and the serfs were still the serfs, but then like the knight's code was adopted by and used by the serfs code Mm. until eventually like everyone was kind of almost living in harmony even though it was still a time of like lawlessness. And so there was was an underlying sense of morals that man-made morals, but, um, or they thought it was man-made. Right. Okay. Interesting. All right. I like that response. Okay. So switching gears again, then um, I, I must admit, you know, you and I, when you were at the grammar school, we had a bit of a tumultuous relationship. Uh, uh, you remember? No? I would be minding my own business, watching a basketball game, and you would jump on my back and kind of oh. grab me around the neck and yeah. all those things. Things you've forgotten now. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And so I just remember being very apprehensive uh, when you were going to come to the upper school and I threatened you and all kinds of things. Um, so how would you say you've grown over your time at MCA? Because if you got me in a chokehold, no, I don't know if I'd get out. Yeah. But uh, So I appreciate you not doing that. You know. Man. So I've been at MCA for 13 years. I've been here all my, all my life. Mm-hmm. And um, so when I was in the grammar school, I was not a good kid. I would cry every day. And, and it was really just like I couldn't handle any sort of stress. Okay. Um, so... Anyone who's been in the grammar school with me, they can attest. You can ask them. I'm not making this up. Um, They're nodding in the background. So okay. Right. Yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. Um, but then when I got to the upper school, it's like everything kind of shifted because then it's like, okay, I'm on, my, I'm, I'm, I'm on my own. I have my own schedule. I have to get my own work done. And um, so then I, like, I did really – I have done really well. And so I, I would say the past couple of years have some of the, been some of the best in my life because it's like I'm able to look back on and see how far I've come. And then, like, look towards the future with hope. And it's like, man, if I've, like, progressed this much in just, like, my short lifespan, how much more can I progress towards a greater good in, like, the rest of my life until the day I die? Yeah. And no, it's, it's great. Yeah, it's evident that you've grown a, a great deal. Um, and so what, what do you think is the primary area, kind of, like, away from just the, the, the topic of chivalry, what do you think in all of life is your primary area that you need to grow as you move forward to this next step? It's a good question. 
I struggled for a uh, a long time with like wanting to conform to like what like uh, like my friends or like my like other people wanted to do. So I would go along with them, mm-hmm. and um, it's like I was under. I hate blaming like influences because it's, it's really me making that choice. But one thing I struggled with was conformity, and so I would do or say things that I don't at all agree with or I hate saying. But it's like I'm in the crowd, so I might as well say these things so I can stay in the crowd. And so I would say one of my biggest struggles in my life has been conforming to what everyone wants me to say or do or act. And so I don't see that being a very big problem in the future. That was really just like junior high, early like um, high school years that I've I've conquered most of that. Every now and then I slip out, slip, like slip back, and I can yeah. feel myself slip back. And I was like, oh, like. I need like a buzzer, like a zapper or something. Like, <laughs> be a shot caller. Uh, yeah, I should wear yeah, a shot caller. Yeah, that, that it's only nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Okay, I have one one more uh, line of questioning, then I'll, I'll pass it back. Um, so you brought up about books, mm-hmm. okay? And so talking about books, and so um, what has been your favorite of the the books from the Great Book Curriculum? Oh great Books Curriculum. Man, that's like asking me my favorite movie. Oh, okay, man. so one of then. Okay, okay, well, man, that, thank you. Uh, man, I really love um, the Odyssey. Hmm. That it's just like I love the, all of the the symbolism that ties into that, and um, I like Greek uh, Greek mythology, and it's like how all the gods get mad at each other, and I can laugh because they don't exist, and it's like yeah. you'll have no bearing over my life. And, yeah, um, which is great. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I would say the Odyssey because I did that presentation in the grammar school for one of them and I remember that being sweet um, and then I remember when we got here I think Mr. Nelson is my teacher that he did an excellent job of te- like teaching us that and everything that went into his journey and how he was tempted and how he overcame and so the overcoming aspect was very like um, what was it very inspirational to okay. me yeah it was okay. a good book alright so what's, what's book. The, the, the book you haven't read that you want to read next mm. So I have like a I, oh man I have like a book list. Um, so one of the authors I mentioned, Brett McKay, he writes other books, mm-hmm. and so my parents got me one book called Starting Out on Your Own, which is kind of like when you leave home, yeah, which is like great. And then uh, Man Devotionals, and so in that book I should have I should have read that one. I had plenty of time. Uh, that it's it ties into like virtues like when you leave home, and so those those two books kind of go together. That okay. I can't wait to read that one. So it's um it's a yeah, it's like I don't know how to say it. It's a, it's a daily reading, okay. so it's like here's a little bit of inspiration in like how to watch yourself, and it's like all right, cool. Okay, so I can't wait to read that one. Or while the heart. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Final question. Then, um, what's the the one book you have read that everybody should read, men and women? Okay. Man. Uh, I would say uh, there's a book I read by uh, Michael Siegel called uh, Not Yet Married. Mm-hmm. And so um, I love his, his whole standpoint because he's like, this is just my, uh, my, my, my personal um, stories. And it's like, take it or leave it. You don't have to follow it. Here's just some advice that you can or cannot take. And so he's like, this can apply for both married people and not married people. Even, and he's like, don't be distracted by the not yet married title. It's like, this is for everybody. And so he deals with some really tough um, struggles and conflicts that result in any relationship that um, I kind of read that one just for the fun of it because my pastor was recommending them to all the single people. And I was like, I'll take one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I would recommend that one. Okay. It's like 12 bucks on Amazon. Like it's, it's, pretty, it's a steal. <laughs> a portion goes to your cause. Right? Yeah. yeah. All all right. Right. I get a 3%. Thanks, all right. Thank you. I'm going to piggyback on Mr. Westfall's Great Books question. Is there a character that you have reread this year in Great Books 2, being my senior assistant, or I'll include Western Lit since I've sat in on some of that class, uh, that you um, can think of that is chivalrous in your eyes? Okay, so I think it was, it was either Grayson or Paul that mentioned Lassiter from uh, Writers of the Purple Sage. And so um, I don't want to steal their example, but it's really hard not to. Um, so Lassiter, it's like he was known as a bad guy, a gunslinger, a gun carrier, and so it's like he wore all black. He was he was a killer of men, and so that earned him a, like that was a bad title, and so it's like, but he didn't go looking for a fight. He just knew who his enemies were, and so um, that's a big that's a big difference between uh, murder and just a gunfight. Um, so with him, it's like he hated any injustice whatsoever between a man or a woman or like what have you. 
that um, he, when he first rode up onto uh, Jane Witherstein's ranch, she was being um, like verbally abused by some of the Mormon men in her village, and they were about to like like pistol whip this guy on the ground. And so he rode up, and then like how it was set up, how he rode up was so awesome. It's like Jane's in one side, and then all the men on the other. And so he rides up with next to Jane, but then as the conversation gets a little more violent, he edges away towards Jane. So the men's attention and potentially their bullets are focused on him and not on her. And so it's like, um, I forgot Zane Gray. He didn't like. He didn't even say, like, "Oh, he did this like you know, like for this reason." It's like no, he, like it was evident that it's like Lassiter was protecting this woman from these evil men, and just by just by moving a few feet to the right. And so I would think Lassiter is one of the, the best characters of chivalry I've ever read. Cool. Um, speaking of chivalry, let's jump uh, to the philosophical train track. Um, there is a famous author that we've read at MCA that wrote a short paper about chivalry. And so I want to read to you uh, what he defined it as and see what your thoughts are on it. And I'll, I'll tell you who came up with this after. Okay. Um, so this guy's idea was that chivalry was the co- was uh, two things. Uh, one idea was being meek in hall, and so what meek in hall meant for these knights was being gentle, modest, demure in civilized society. Mm-hmm. That's on one hand, and now on the other hand is this side of blood and iron, okay, mm-hmm. which is ruthless, stern, and unbending in battle. Yes. Now. This uh, philosopher did not view this as, okay, you're 50% one and 50% of the other. It's not the golden mean. Um, it's being completely blood and iron when you're defending your home, and it's completely being meek and hall mm-hmm. when you're away from the battlefield. Uh, what do you think about that concept of chivalry? So, I'll, I'll, I'll read that after that, but... Um, Going into uh, defending your home from an enemy, um, it's like if you have any, it's hard to say it without me sounding really like violent or mean, but um, it's like if someone to, like if someone breaks into your house and they want to kill your wife and your daughter, what would you let up on stopping him? No. This okay, I was like, I get that oh, question. please say no. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Snell, no. No. Uh, <laughs> I'm no. the questioner. You're the answer. Okay. So, like, with that, it's like, there should be no let-up if someone is invading your country to kill and pillage and destroy. Um, that it's like, yeah, men are, are, like, little boy. Like, if you, like, compare, like, a little boy and a little girl, the little boy is, like, really violent. And uh, it's like, there's something in us that just, like, attracts violence. And um, so it's like, if we try to, like, desensitize ourselves by being like a little more graceful and it's like that's okay as long as we're like um like with my contrary paragraph is uh like the world wanting men to be less manly and so part of being a man is having being a man of action and so when someone evades your country or wants to kill someone you step in and you do whatever like whatever is necessary to stop that man in his tracks and so, like, with a man being meek, it's like the complete flip side. It's just like we're called, like, we're also called to be gentle and caring and loving and, um, like, hope, kindness, love. And uh, it's like, it's a, it'd be a really hard switch to flip if you went from being, like, brutal to being, like, really calm and peaceful and picking daisies. That um, I do believe that there's a turnoff switch, there's possibly a golden mean. That's very black and white. Um, but sometimes we have to be black and white to get a good answer. Okay, it is a hard switch to flip, um, but C.S. Lewis said it's an art to be aspired to and not something that will ever be fully achieved. Mm. That contradicts your paper a little bit because you said that if you are chivalrous, you will be chivalrous all the time. How do you reconcile those two things? Do you think C.S. Lewis is wrong? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It's like I want a little brick wall right here. Uh, so the idea of being chivalrous is that you are supposed to be all the time. Are we? No. It's like there's places that we'll stumble and fall and we'll become of this world and we'll, we'll let our flesh take over. And so um, my idea for my paper is that like we are supposed to be chivalrous all the time, every second and millisecond of our life, and, um, but we're not because we're human and it is that's a... That's a that's another thing to say, like, oh, like, because we're human, and it's like, um, it's really a heart issue. 
that. I think uh, Jack Swallow is one of the best gentlemen I know in my life because, as far as I can see, I've never seen him. I've never seen him yell at his wife or do anything um, terribly wrong. That um, I don't feel like he turns off at chivalry as soon as he gets home and sets the suitcase, suitcase down. That um, yeah, his is yeah. Yeah, so you might also say that he doesn't turn off his Christ-likeness yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyways, I liked what C.S. Lewis says because in our walk with the Lord, it, we will never truly be Christ-like, right? Mm-hmm. And as we become sanctified throughout our lives, at the end of our life, we will be more like Christ than we were when we began our journey, but we will still never be exactly Christ-like, right? And so I think that's... I like what C.S. Lewis described it as as an art to be aspired to mm-hmm. um, rather than something you can achieve. Um, my follow-up question to that is, um, is it possible to be chivalrous in today's world with that um, definition of it if we don't have a place uh, for blood and iron? Is it possible to be chivalrous without having that like brutal side of us? Right, like I'm not going to go out after assembly today and defend my homeland from the invading Mongols. You know? So, yes, it is possible, because we're not supposed to seek out violence. It's like, because that's wrong. Because that, then we're picking a fight, and we're like, we have pride. It's like, we can win this fight, so we're going to go start fights. Um, so, like, just being meek, I would almost, like, I would say that's not okay to be meek all the time. It's like, it's like you are a man of action, and that's one of, one of the things Brett McKay says. It's like, we're not supposed to stand on the sidelines, even when it's easy, or the world tells us to. It's like, we're supposed to go out and correct something that's wrong. And so um, I think of, like, the, the picture of, like, a sweet old man living alone, um, like, in the forest, and it's, like, there's, like, someone who needs, like, a bike got broken, and so, he like, he fixes it. And it's, like, he didn't rush out there with a gun. I was, like, what are you doing on my land? Uh, he's, like, he wasn't violent at all. He was just helping the poor person. And so um, there is there is a balance between the two, but being brutal and being um, violent, I guess, you, is the best way to say it. Um, should like should be your last your last thing you do, but every now and then it should it should be the first thing you do. Okay, uh, with that answer, I'll pass the mic to Mr. Fithian. Okay, um, let's talk about Jesus. Oh, good. What, was he chivalrous? Oh yes. How? So. Uh, <laughs> that's a big mug. It is a big mug. It's a good like, stalling technique. <laughs> it's like, hold on. Yeah, <laughs> so was Jesus 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 chivalrous? Yes, he was. So, um, like a clear example would be the when he meets the Samaritan woman at the well, and so it's like. I feel like the jerky thing he could have done and been like, man, you're like with all these guys and it's like, you're not even with your husband right now. And it's like, he could have done that and it would have made her feel terrible. And like, it, yes, it would have been true, but it would, it would have been the wrong way to bring up the wrong thing or the right things. And um, so I can't remember his exact, an- like his exact wording or his answer to the woman, but um, it like stopped her cold, but he didn't raise his voice. He just spoke truth, and that like that revealed so much about that woman that the woman was like, "Oh, like not even my family knows this." And uh, so, I I do believe Jesus is chivalrous. That that makes me think um, Jesus's version of was it meek and hall and blood and iron is speaking love and grace and truth. He was able to do both to the full extent. Um, Okay, so you you gave the example of a home invader to Mr. Snell. Mm -hmm. Was there a home invader that Jesus had to deal with? So that could be, like, really symbolic. It's like the devil could be a home invader into our hearts. So it's like you could go there, or you could bring up the tax collectors in the temple because they were the wrong people in the wrong place, the very wrong place. Um, so he, I believe he was chivalrous when he threw those guys out and literally flipped their tables and reveal, like revealed their, their sins. That it's like that was an intruder into a physical temple that he threw them out. And it's like he was literally cracking whips. Like he was trying to get people to realize, hey, this is wrong. And um, so was, was that a good answer to your question? Or I can't remember your real question. Sorry. Yeah, what, how did Jesus deal with the home invader? So, um, going back to, 
I think it was around my sixth or seventh paragraph, talking about um, being sacrificial. So, um, obviously, Jesus is the, the greatest sacrifice. And so, the only way that he could, that he could find a way to make sure we didn't, any, like, none of us could have any home intruders into our hearts that we ourselves didn't let in, is that he died for us. And so, as a gentleman, um, even for all of us, it's like, I don't, I don't believe for a second y'all wouldn't give y'all's, y'all's lives up in an instant to protect your friends or family. Um, and if I'm wrong, we need to have a talk later. Um, but I do believe he, was, he, was, he is the greatest gentleman that has been and ever will be. I like that answer. What's the um, symbolism that we use for Christ being uh, led to the cross? There's an animal. Lamb that was slain. Right. And what's the symbolism we use for him when he returns? Lion and the lamb. Right. Did, can, y'all, can you unpack that a little bit? How does that fit into this conversation? So when Mr. Snell brought up like the, like the really like right and left side of like chivalry, it's like meek and really violent. I immediately thought lamb, uh, not lamb, lion was the really violent one and the lamb was really meek one. And so when Jesus comes back, those two will be combined. But um, I think like one way you could look at that is just like, it's like you will be, yeah, you will be aggressive in your kindness. Like, and I know that sounds kind of scary. It's like, I'm going to be so nice to you. Like, you won't know what hit you. And it's like, that's scary. <laughs> like, um, so there is, uh, I'll say it, a golden mean of uh, lion and lamb and brutal and meekness that um, I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, but I'm excited to find out. I like that answer. Um, can you think, think of someone in the Bible who we, we wouldn't maybe on face value call them a knight, but they were knightly chivalrous? So I would say David is like my first answer because it's like everyone thinks of David. Um, but I would say Daniel because he was, it's like, yes, David was per- like persecuted literally by his own son. That's terrible. But Daniel is a unique example because he was literally in the heart of Babylon. And like Revelation talks all about Babylon. And, um, but he was in the heart of the enemy and he stayed strong. And he didn't give up and he was, he was fed to lions. And God closed their mouth. So it's like, I believe that when we stand up for what is right under God, then God will protect us. And so it's like, he will equip us and send us out. And it's like, we can't equip ourselves to fight a like, I don't know, if you were a lion, I would lose in a heartbeat. Um, but it's like, God would protect me. And so it's like, when we're chivalrous, God will lead us, like, um, God will lead, like, guide our steps. And so Daniel is one of the, like, one of the best examples I can think of outside, outside of Jesus. Uh, what a chivalrous man in the Bible looks like. I I really enjoy that answer. Um, It it brings to mind the, is in Corinthians, like we are broken vessels with Christ's light shining through us. Um, Very good. I'm I'm good. Thank you, Caden. Welcome. All right, we're running short, so we'll make it quick. Okay, so I want to kind of have a, a, with chivalry, is it niceness? Niceness? Yeah, is chivalry niceness? Because, like, opening doors and doing that thing. Because um, I'm just wondering, is that... Yeah. So, I believe chivalry is a kind of niceness. But, like, with, like with being nice, it's like you could, like, be untruthful. And it's like, I don't know, like, I do like your hair. But if, like, I was a, like if I didn't like it, I'd be like, yeah, it looks good. Yeah, sure. And it's like, that would, that would not be... I don't be like the way you looked at my hair when you said... Okay. <laughs> um, so, it's like, um, being nice... Nice to me is kind of a weak word. I replace it with kindness. Okay. And I would. Um, so being kind, it's like. Uh, what was your original question? <laughs> now I'm distracted by your hair. It's like. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> good now. Here, right, we're, we're going somewhere. All right. So I'm going to give you an example of kind of where I would say Jesus interacted with somebody. It doesn't seem chivalrous to me. Uh, a woman came to Jesus with a demon. She said, my, my daughter's demon possessed. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so this is what Jesus says. Hey, he says to her, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so she says, Lord, help me. And then Jesus says to her, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. So it's a pretty radical situation. Yeah, that's a, that's a big situation. Yeah. yeah. The, here's this woman whose daughter's demon possessed, and Jesus is basically like, I'm only for the Israelites. Yeah. And then she presses him, and he says, well, I'm not going to throw it to the little dogs. So it's a... 
So I guess what I'm getting at, I don't find in my own life that I always feel that God treats me chivalrously, if you will. Yeah. You know what I mean? That he doesn't always open the door. And so do you remember how that, that turned out? What she responded? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Um, it was talking about feeding like the crumbs to the dogs underneath the table or yes, something? Yes, okay. right. She uh, says, yeah. Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And then mm-hmm. Jesus responds, Oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. Mm-hmm. What do you think Jesus was doing? He, he seemed to treat her roughly, but what yes. was he going for? So I think he was testing her, like, obviously. And, um, or maybe not obviously, that'd be mean. Um, that, it's obvious now. <laughs> yeah, I was like, let's not exclude anybody. All right. Um, so Jesus tests us, and so he'll give us situations that we think, like, oh, this is really like weird, or like we don't think we can handle it. And he's like, I'm really just testing you to see what your character is. And so he was testing that woman. And so it's like, um, I can't remember the context for like, did that little girl invite the demon into her heart? It's like, was it a choice? We, or don't, we don't have it. Yeah. Yet. Yeah, we're not. So yeah. uh, I don't know. So it's interesting. I guess what I'm just helping you and maybe all of us to see that chivalry is something good, but there may be something above that, mm. right? That the Lord may work in ways that don't look chivalrous to us, um, that is pretty radical. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, last question before we turn the mic over to you. Um, with manliness, does manliness mean we must be, men must be physically strong to be manly? No. Okay. So um, a stereotype I have seen, especially nowadays, is that men wear um, mediums and uh, they look big, and it's like, oh, there's a Clay, not to point you out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I won't point so, you out by pointing you out. Yeah. So. I was like, I'm not going to say it, but yeah. um, it's like the stereotype of a man having a lot of muscle. Yeah. Um, it's like. Oh, like he—he's a man, and it's like he can—he can really chop wood and carry water, and right. um, that uh, does that make him a man? Right. No. Okay. And so, like, my like reason for that is just like, um, like a homeless man on the street with no muscle, and like none of that. But if he still has those virtues, he's a chivalrous man, okay. and if he lives them out, he's a chivalrous man. So. Um, Yes. Yeah, yeah that's good. That. And that's what I, I wondered because, you know, like the Apostle Paul, I would consider him a man. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet he talked about how the Corinthians said, hey, that his bodily presence is weak. Mm-hmm. And so, and then, you know, Paul tells us the outward man is perishing and the inward man is being renewed day by day. Yes. Because no matter how manly we may be at some point, if you live long enough, it's going to decline. Yes. Right? Your physical strength is going to decline. Um, and so I, was, I just wanted to kind of make that distinction. Mm-hmm. All right. It's your turn. All right. So, I have three different questions, and so, Mr. 15, I'd like you to pick a number between one and three. Really broad. I want to say four. Uh, oh. Three. Okay. Do you, do you consider yourself to be chivalrous, godly, and a gentleman, and why? We can also pass the mic if you like, need to think about that. No, this, this I, f- I find it to be a really interesting question. Um, going back to Paul as you read through the progressions of his letters from when he first converted to the end of his life he you know he starts out like I'm a servant of Christ and then he moves into like I'm a sinner who serves Christ to the end of his life where it's like I'm the worst of all sinners Mm -hmm. and the thought that I think most of us had on would have on first impression is well towards the end of your life you should be more like Jesus Mm mm-hmm like we should be done with this whole sin thing, right? We've we've tackled that. We've had years to tackle that. Yeah. Why, why aren't we making progress, Paul? Um, and I think a little bit of what's going on there is he's talking about his sin nature, and it, it's not something that God has removed. Mm-hmm. And the further he has gone in walking with the Spirit and in his new man, he sees just how broken the old man is. Mm-hmm. Um, so I bring that up to say there are parts of my life that I have grown in and that I do think exemplify Christ and there are other parts that I wish I desperately wish were not a problem mm-hmm. but they are Yes. Um, and so it, it really does take uh, submitting my heart and my thoughts to Christ consistently Otherwise, that sin nature is just raring for the next opportunity to grab a hold of my decision maker, whatever you want to call that, and like steer down whatever 
death-laden path they can find. Um, so does that yes answer your question? So awesome. Yes and no. Cool. That's a good answer. Thank you. Um, Mr. Westfall, one or two? Go two. Okay. Why would you want your daughter to marry a chivalrous man? Um, well, because uh, <laughs> I would, you, you would want your children to be treated well, mm -hmm. right? And so obviously I want my daughters to be treated well. Um, so it's a pretty straightforward question. Um, okay. That's, I don't know. What else you want from that? Okay. Know, as a no, that's completely trailer. your answer. I'm not going to. I'm not going to leave yeah, you on. Yeah, obviously, because you want the best for him, right? And so, but I, I think it, it doesn't go only to my daughters. Like I would want every woman to be married to a man who treats them well. Mm -hmm. And so, I think that that's. I think that's something that broadens out as you get older. And the older you get, the more that you start seeing. I would say every young person that you have interaction with as a son or daughter. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's important. I think that we should, we have certain responsibilities, right, for, for our, our physical children. Um, but I think that as God kind of broadens you out, you realize, well, I'm, I'm not financially responsible for these other people, but they're just as valuable as, as those that, that share the, the genetics with me. So Thank you. That's a good answer. All right, Mr. Snell, one or one? One sweet man. Why would you want your your future son to be a godly gentleman? Future son to be a godly gentleman. You also, you also have to name him Caitlin after me. <laughs> <laughs> You'll always be reminded of me. <laughs> I would want him to be a gentleman because I would want him to be Christ-like. I think that we've tried to tie that connection together in the discussion, but I think it comes down to that. Thank you. And to the question that you did not ask. Uh, I would be a, a manly, manly Muppet. There it so. is. Uh, I really wanted to ask you that question, but I was like, I think like maybe like a third of the audience aren't going to get that joke. That yeah. Awesome. You just talked about being a manly man, a man's man, so much yeah. that I just couldn't help but think of your a manly, manly Muppet song. We can reenact yeah. it real quick. No, we're not going to reenact it. <laughs> All right, Cade Manuel, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, we did a great job, and um, we're really proud of you. Thank you. Joe? Yeah. That's it? Yes, I'll pray. Okay. Lord, thanks so much for this day and uh, for Cademan um, and the man you've created him to be and the values that you've given him and what he cares for. We pray that you continue to grow him in those and that you continue to help him share those uh, and his passion with others, um, that you would ultimately lead him and, and those others that he'll influence uh, towards you. Um, we just praise you and thank you for this day, and we um, praise all these things in your name. Amen. <laughs>